Viewer discretion is advised. My research had led me to a small island off the coast of northern Japan. It was speculated that there was some hidden temple in the area, full of artifacts, buried by time and waiting to be dug up. But on one cold winter day while milling about the dig site, I saw something that didn't match the browns, greens, and grays of nature that surrounded the area. Instead, my eyes were transfixed on a large patch of golden brown. Curious and confused by this, I left my crew behind and wandered through some trees before I found myself standing in front of it. I slowly crouched down and ran my hands through it and was stunned to feel that it felt like fur. Deeply puzzled, I took out my pocket knife and took a small sample to analyze without telling any of my peers. After a few hours of testing, the results indicated that what I had found was indeed fur. Fur that belonged to a corgi, as a matter of fact. Baffled by this, I quickly gathered up the other archaeologists and researchers and showed them my discovery. We all were stumped as to how it was possible for the fur to be so well preserved but excited nonetheless. We quickly posted our findings online and turned our attention back to digging up the area. Pretty soon, we discovered that this mass of fur kept going and going no matter how far we excavated the area. Around a week later, we were met by Japanese officials and some odd man who went by Agent S. He instructed us that we were to close up immediately and that our dig was to be taken over by the Japanese government. Oh well, I hope whoever they are, they have the means to take good care of this furry creature. Have a feeling that it means us no harm. Could be an actual corgi, I wonder. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Safe Class Object SCP-2952. SCP-2952, also known as C-O-R-G-I, is classified as safe and is most likely one of the most bizarre and adorable anomalous entities that the Foundation has come across. Many Foundation researchers are proud to report that 2952 is an anomalous Pembroke Welsh Corgi. What makes this corgi unique is the fact that it is just shy of over 30,000 kilometers in length. Its little head and front paws are located near three Portlands while its hindquarters are in rural Japan. The rest of its body weaves across the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Furthermore, 2952 is thought to have the ability to infinitely regenerate through unknown means. Should any part of its body be damaged, it will repair itself very quickly. Samples of tissue taken have proven to be capable of rebuilding themselves regardless of what damage it sustains. As to how this is possible, no one knows. Oddly enough, 2952 does not require sustenance of any kind and refuses to move more than a few feet away from its original position. Something that has been speculated is that 2952 is able to change the shape of its body, making it thinner or larger in places. This is thought to help keep its body out of sight by the general public and dangerous animals, or as a way to blend in with the environment. This has only been seen once in an incident involving archaeologists in rural Japan, who have since had their memories of 2952 removed. Other than the incredible length of 2952, its body seems to operate as a unique and anomalous transportation system. Travel is done through tiny openings a few centimeters wide and tall on its body that open on a schedule. These entrances have been designated as SCP-2952-1. Humanoid beings around 3 centimeters in height can be seen entering and exiting such openings. Such entities are not visible to the naked eye unless captured on film or through photographs. None are outwardly hostile unless provoked and have been designated as SCP-2952-2. Many of them share physical characteristics of fairies and forest nymphs, but on a much smaller scale. An experiment was undertaken by Project Director Stevens who ordered several Foundation personnel to block and bury portions of 2952. This was done in order to prevent the general public from stumbling across its body. A few days after this was complete, Director Stevens went missing. In his place was a mole that was dressed up to look like Director Stevens. Dr. Mills, who was working alongside the crew and was tasked with collecting tissue samples, woke up one morning with poisonous berries in his mouth and sharpened stakes driven through his feet and hands. 
Believing these two events to be directly related to 2952, the Foundation researched all myths related to fairies and similar entities. After collecting a plethora of information, they found all the possible ways to appease such creatures and performed all the rituals necessary. As soon as a number of rituals were completed, Director Stevens switched places with the mole. He has stated he has no recollection of what happened while he was gone. As for Dr. Mills, he was no longer harassed by instances of 2952-2. However, the wounds he sustained have not healed. Modern medicine nor anomalous means have proven successful in closing his wounds. The instances of 2952-2 sent a letter to Foundation personnel stating they were content with the appeasement but to never block the gates again. The Foundation has since dedicated a task force to ensure that no gates are ever blocked by any means. As a reward, members of the Foundation have been granted the privilege of being capable of seeing instances of 2952-2 with the naked eye. Agent Davies was sent to explore the transportation system located within 2952. She touched 2952's warm, furry body and shrunk down to a size no more than an inch. Then she was granted entrance. Inside were around a dozen or so instances of 2952-2, sitting down on wooden benches covered in petals. Now departing from three Portlands. Next stop, West Coast Rainforest. Agent Davies looked around the interior. It looked just like the usual L trains, but more in tune with nature. Everything was made of wood, leaves, grass, moss, mushrooms, and the like. The walls, ceiling, and floor appeared to be constructed of birch bark wrapped around thin twigs. The walls were lined with seats, which are cushioned with a variety of flower petals. A welcoming sight, considering her expectation of the dog's interior to be more fleshy. Also a good escape from the Foundation's dour and hard floors. As she sat down, Agent Davies heard a voice from her earpiece. Agent, you are free to engage in conversation if needed. Well, all right then. Tech seems to be unaffected by the changes in environment. Good to know. Time to get in touch with nature. Agent Davies noticed that the 2952-2 entities resembled humans, but were of earthly skin tones. Some had wings, others had vegetation growing out of their bodies, most of them were rather jovial and acted just like humans. Agent Davies casually sat beside one of them. Hey, uh, how's it going? Beautiful day, huh? Well, you know, I just hope this thing isn't late again. I tried to make it to the glades in time to harvest some seeds the other day. Everything was gone by the time I arrived. But, you know, that's how it is sometimes. Do you know why it's been late? Some kind of internal blockage. Poor thing's got injuries somewhere down in the tail section, I hear. Aw, oh, poor thing. Another passenger from the front turned towards them and joined their conversation. Somebody tried to hijack this train, you see. Wait, a hijacker? So was it like a human or... He was one of us, I think. I don't know. He was dressed in all black and had a mask on. Pretty bold, too. Hijacking the train with just himself. Can you tell me what happened? Well, it was just a usual Tuesday. I was taking the train as usual from my place to where I harvest my mushrooms. I was sitting in the tail section, that's where I usually sit. It was pretty mundane, but damn, do I regret what I was thinking that day. Man, I hope something exciting would happen to me. This is so boring. Huh, what the hell was that? Suddenly, something loud came from behind where I was sitting. A man dressed in all black pulled out his revolver and fired a single shot in the air. I mean upwards. It hit the roof and the train shook a little. All right, nobody moves. If it ain't clear enough, this is a hijacking situation. I have a gun and a bomb hidden somewhere in this car. If I press this button right here, train goes boom. So no sudden movement. Don't try to be a hero. The passenger under his boot asked him in a shaky voice. Oh, what do you want, man? What do I want? It's very simple. I want you to shut the hell up and stay down. The hijacker seemed to know the train pretty well, including the conductor too. He then spoke into one of the surveillance cameras that was hidden really well, or at least that's what I think he was doing. If you don't want the train or your good boy to blow up right now, be here immediately. That entire car waited for an uncomfortable 10 minutes or so, but no one replied from the intercom or showed up. Everyone was on edge. The hijacker was getting impatient too. Why don't you tell us what you want and we work it out? 
I don't know what came over me that made me start negotiating with him. Not gonna lie, my heart dropped and I was about to wet my pants when he suddenly glared and pointed his gun at me. Ooh, someone's trying to play hero, huh? All right, I'll entertain you. What I want is very simple. I want this train to stop its operation. No more joy rides across the world. That, that, that's it? Yep, plain and simple. I hate dog trains. Suddenly, he was overcome with rage and fired more shots into the roof. Poor thing must have felt them. Each time he fired, the train shook more violently. I couldn't take it anymore, and I was not the only one who thought the same during that moment. You are a despicable, hateful, and joyless being. I tried to reason with you, but that was simply unreasonable. How can you not like Corgi? Yeah, how can you say such things about something this, this cute? At that point, everyone seemed like they were ready to jump on him, even when the hijacker was waving his gun around. Hey, hey, stop moving, you all. You don't want to get shot now, do you? I still have the bomb. Ugh. The train suddenly swerved hard. It made everyone lose balance for a second. Corgi must have known what was going on and tried to help us. Most of us seized the opportunity to rush towards the hijacker to bring him down. I got a hold of his gun arm and he fired more shots recklessly, but eventually I got control of the gun and pointed it back at him. Stop, I still have my detonator. If I press this button, somehow he still had his detonator in his hand. Oh yeah, but can you react faster than this gun here? Right now, I have it right up against your head and you gotta ask yourself one question. Did you fire six shots or only five? I'm sure in all this commotion, you've lost track of it yourself. But being at the other end of the barrel, one squeeze from my finger can blow your head clean off. So ask yourself another question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? He was shaking then and slowly let go of his detonator and the day was saved. Did you really say that? I swear I heard that speech somewhere. Well, I guess you'll have to take my word for it then and I'm afraid I'll have to leave you now. This is my station. As the passenger got up, Agent Davies stopped him. Wait, before you leave, tell me, was it five shots or six? I got to know. The passenger only chuckled and left the train. At the end of her trip, she ended up in the West Coast rainforest where Foundation personnel were waiting to pick her up. So, how was your little trip? A good bit of fun. Wouldn't mind commuting to work like that every day, actually. Hey, you have the number of the vet you took your dog to the other day? All right, think we're all done here now. He gathered his tools and stepped out of 2952. He then patted its side. Good boy. He could see its tail further down the dog train, wagging happily. Viewer discretion is advised. The alarms went off and Builder Bear was spotted with its creations rampaging through Site 24. Quick, we need to contain it right away. We can't let it disappear again. Wait, where are you going? A bear with colorful patches slipped through Dr. Manson's legs. It ran across the hallway as fast as its stubby legs could, making a beeline towards the injured personnel. It took one look at the man's missing limb and immediately fashioned one up with its own material. You're just that selfless, aren't you? Men, I need cover for Kairos over there. I'll go bring any cloth I can find for him to do his work. When Dr. Manson returned with the necessary materials, the bear was nowhere to be seen among the chaos. Following the trail of patched up personnel, he found the bear silently hugging a young boy in a D-class uniform. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Safe Class Object SCP-2295. SCP-2295, also known as the bear with a heart of patchwork, is a patchwork stuffed bear. It is approximately 18 inches from head to foot and is stuffed with synthetic fiber and cotton. 2295 has a small, anatomically correct pin of a heart on the left side of its thorax and a bow wrapped around its neck. The fabric and color of 2295's patches vary. Tests confirm that no components of 2295 contain any anomalous chemical properties. 2295 goes active when within seven feet of a human sustaining major trauma to an organ. It will anomalously produce scissors, white thread, and either sewing needles or a crocheting hook from its mouth. Then use any fabric and stuffing within reach to fashion an instance of SCP-2295-1, a patchwork imitation of the subject's organ. 2295-1 vanishes from sight while the subject falls unconscious. It will then replace the subject's damaged organ via anomalous means. 
the whereabouts of the replaced organs are undetermined. If there is no usable material in close proximity, 2295 will use fabric and stuffing from itself. 2295 regenerates one gram of stuffing every day until completely replacing any lost or used stuffing. Note that fabric used this way does not regenerate, and additional fabric must be placed near 2295 for the purpose of self-mending. There have been no cases of rejected 2295-1 instances, and all subjects recorded at the time of writing made full recoveries. Originally, 2295 was just a sentient, plain brown bear doll under the care of a boy named Michael. One day, 2295 found itself lying on wet grass in the yard. The house was on fire. It found an open window and plopped right in. The bear soldiered through the inferno and found Michael lying at the bottom of the stairs, barely moving. The boy was coated head to toe in burns. His hair had been singed off and what was left of his clothes had fused to his flesh in places. 2295 frantically looked about, searching for something, anything it could use to repair him, but everything was in flames. There was no way to help the boy here. They had to get out. It tried to drag Michael to safety, but it couldn't even lift his arm. As the floor quaked and the ceiling gave, 2295 could do nothing but cry and hug the boy. Together, they plummeted into the earth. The next day, the firefighters couldn't find the boy among the rubble. Sorry, ma'am, we couldn't find your son. Only this. A firefighter handed the woman a damaged teddy bear. As she wept and hugged it, she could feel it hugging her back. Time passed and 2295 regained consciousness once again, finding itself in front of its own reflection. Patches of colorful cloth had replaced its drab brown body and a pretty bow to tie the look together. A gentle hand picked it up. It was a man the bear had never seen before. Hope you don't mind my shoddy work. And looky here. He lifted up a card that said, Hello, my name is Kairos. The bear tilted its head and looked at the man in confusion. It's ancient Greek. It means an opportune moment. Figured it suits you. Now you're going to find that perfect opportune moment to swoop in and be there for others where no one else can. The bear nodded gleefully. The man then nestled it affectionately into a box alongside the note. He waved goodbye to the bear and reached down for the lid. 2295 was recovered at the site of a crashed delivery mail van. When authorities arrived, it was found out of the box, sitting next to the injured but patched up driver. Ever since its arrival at the foundation, 2295 has helped many people. You look wonderful. Are these the works of the bear? Yeah, aren't they amazing? It's like getting a tattoo, but without the needle stabbing part. Just burns. Damn, now my face feels a little bland compared to my body. Wouldn't mind getting burned a little more to get more color on my face. <laughs> my heart used to beat like crazy every time I moved a little. Thought I was about to die. But then I was offered a chance to undergo an operation by the stuffed teddy bear. Now here I am, feeling better than ever. From the corner of the rim, the bear caught the attention of the D-Class while peeking over the tall crates. It hopped over and they greeted 2295, then embraced one another. Hey bear! I heard that evil twin brother bear of yours went on a rampage, hurt a lot of people. I'm sure you saved everyone's lives there too, right? Upon hearing that, 2295 appeared saddened and began retreating back to the corner. However, it was intercepted by Dr. Manson. He picked the teddy bear up gently and stroked its head, then rested it on the table. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, fellas, but a young man, one of the D-Class subjects, didn't make it. The D-Classes were in shock. They looked over to the bear in disbelief as it lowered its head and hid itself behind Dr. Manson. How can that be? Ain't that bear right there a magic surgeon or something? Yes, Kairos here is capable of fantastic feats of surgery. There's no doubt about that. Even so, there's a limit to its abilities. You see, he can only replace things that are broken, but not fixing them. The boy suffered severe cerebral hemorrhage during the time when SCP-1048 made its appearance. One of its creations, 1048-C, damn near maimed the poor boy. Kairos tried his hardest to gather what available materials within proximity to initiate repairs. But the young man's life was rapidly fading at the time, so perhaps Kairos didn't have enough time to fashion the necessary parts to replace the faulty ones. Or perhaps it was more complicated than just simply replacing parts. Too many factors at play, Dr. Manson said as he stroked the depressed teddy bear's head. So, could Kairos do anything for the lad before he passed? Kairos conjured a sweet, 
Dove's king-size chocolate candy bar and gave it to the young man. It was his favorite. He was fading in and out of consciousness then, but luckily, he was aware of Kairos's kindness. Thank you, he said weakly as he grasped the candy bar. Kairos spent the rest of his time embracing him while his eyes produced a saline solution. So, what? He was curing him with a solution or something? He was crying, genius. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Kairos, don't be sad. You've done so much for us. Look around, we're standing here alive and kicking all because of you. Upon hearing the D-Class's kind words, 2295 looked up at them with its beady eyes. Yeah, look at me. I've also got these awesome colored patches all over my body. It's better than any tattoo I could ever ask for. D-3452 patted on its head and wiped the liquid around its eyes. As soon as D-3452 retracted his hand, 2295's eyes got soaked again immediately. It reached out both its stubby hands towards the humans. Oh, come here, you little fuzzball. You've done a lot of good, Kairos. More than enough. Be proud of that. I know I am. Together, the men and the teddy bear embraced each other in silence. Saline solution rolled down its cheeks once more. Viewer discretion is advised. When I was nine years old, I would often hear odd noises coming from either my closet door or beneath my bed. My parents explained that the noises were nothing more than the house groaning. I bought into it after a while and soon didn't think much of the noises, that is, until one particular night. I was having trouble falling asleep and was cuddling my little stuffed bear when I heard a scratching sound against the inside of my closet. I rolled my eyes before trying to fall asleep again. That is, until the door handle began to slowly turn and the door started to open. Cowering and shaking, I saw a long and disjointed, black, monstrous arm release the door handle. Stepping out of the closet was a black, demonic-looking creature with goblin-like features. In fear, I watched it get low to the ground and proceed to stalk me, licking its lips and pointing sharp claws at me. Before it could pounce upon me, my teddy bear Caesar jumped from my arms and entered a combat stance. Two orbs of light then appeared above its head that transformed into a wooden sword and shield respectively. The monster let out a hateful cry before engaging in combat with Caesar. The creature was swift and strong, but Caesar was smart and tactful. He countered with sword slashes and finally weakened the creature to the point he could slice its head off. I watched as the monster's head rolled away from its body before disintegrating into a dark mist. Caesar's weapons then vanished as he scurried back to my bed, patted me on the head, and promptly became inanimate again. Utterly baffled by the experience, I went to sleep without questioning what had happened. I never saw Caesar come back to life again or another monster for that matter. I know I wasn't dreaming of what I saw. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Keter Class Object SCP-6852. SCP-6852, also known as Where Best Friends Are Made, are hostile entities of varying appearance that are consistently described as scary, terrifying, and monsters by young children. Instances of 6852 have been identified by the Foundation as entities hostile to young children. Regardless of their appearance, all instances tend to have long teeth, claws, or other sharpened appendages. These creatures typically live in or manifest under beds and within closets, most often in the room of the child. During the day, they tend to be inactive, instead of opting to kill their prey during nighttime. While instances of 6852 are perfectly capable of killing children with relative ease, they relish in playfully hunting them. This is hypothesized to be a form of entertainment for 6852 instances, scaring the children greatly before pouncing on them. Oddly enough, if the child who is being hunted hides under their blanket, 6852 will not harm them. This is due to their preference of seeing their prey before killing them. In addition to their sharpened appendages, 6852 instances are graced with two abnormal properties that aid them in their hunts. The first is that they can produce anti-mimetic camouflage, rendering them invisible to anyone but young children. Second, their bodies are able to silence noises within any localized area, such as a child's bedroom. In order to combat the steadily rising number of attacks by instances of 6852, the Foundation created Procedure 6852-BEAR. This procedure is carried out through the Build-A-Bear Workshop Corporation. Yes, the company was created specifically for this purpose. 
As for the procedure itself, it seeks to make artificial copies of SCP-6330 to fight 6852 instances and protect the children in these cases. The process is as follows. First, a child chooses the type of bear that they want, accessorizing it as they so desire. Then, an employee will stuff the bear with stuffing infused with Elan Vita Energy, or EVE. The employee will then give the child a fabric heart and instruct the child to tap and rub the heart, as well as telling the child to rub the heart on a part of their body to give the bear a gift. For example, rubbing the heart on one's head will ensure the bear will be the smartest bear alive. This completes the thaumaturgical ritual and the bear will now activate when in the presence of a 6852 instance, or when not looked upon by a living entity. The creation of these artificial instances of 6330 has resulted in the termination of 6852 instances around 97% of the time. However, things have started to change. Good morning, Director. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me today. I, well, I have some news that I believe you need to hear. Go on then, you sounded distressed in your email, so I assumed it was quite important. Thank you. Well, I was going over the number of attacks by 6852 instances, and you told me to let you know of any changes in data, and as much as I hate to say it, well, you see, relax, Dr. Had. What did you find? All right, okay, okay. It is estimated that within 10 years, one in four children attacked by 6852 will die, and procedure 6852 bear will be able to kill instances of 6852 only 7% of the time. How? Why the sudden jump? When did this happen? I thought the numbers were relatively stable. The instances of 6852 are becoming stronger, and fewer children have been coming to the workshops. Of course, many children have been saved by simply hiding under their covers, but our artificial 6330s are losing a lot more than before. Damn it. All right, here is what we're going to do. We will do free giveaways, donations, and get more artificial 6330s out in the world for children. I'm sure we can spring for some cash for marketing as well. As for the increased number of dying children, what do you have in mind? I have an idea, but I'll get back to you on that later. For now, let's focus on the task at hand. Together, Dr. Had and Director Anan initiated a successful marketing and donation campaign to get more artificial 6330s out to more children. As the increasing number of 6852 instances became too much to handle, the artificial 6330s were given a secondary function. Director, we need to talk. I knew this would happen, but first, let me... What the hell were you thinking? Having the stuffed bear to stand aside when it fails to kill the monster and let the child die under its hands? It's for the greater good. Once the monster vanishes, it will come out of hiding and obtain the child's Eve and put it into itself. That will make them stronger than before. We will then retrieve the bear and pass it on to the next child. But at what cost? We're talking about human lives here. Surely we can figure out a better way. But there is no better way. We are being inundated with anomalies and we are low on resources. It's not ideal, but 6852 cannot be contained, nor can it be prevented from manifesting. So, for now, this is the best damn thing we have against something as unpredictable as this. I hate this. This isn't right. This isn't fair. They're just kids. Nothing is ever fair in this world, Dr. Had. Which is why we have to be fair. We are the foundation, for goodness sake. We're supposed to protect humanity. We're supposed to be better than this. You're being idealistic, Doctor. The world is unfair and uncaring. Look at the bright side. This will work out in the long run, and you'll be thankful. Believe me. For now, I've had someone to come up with some solutions to cover up the children's deaths by anomalous means, so you don't have to worry about that. You are dismissed, Dr. Had. Have a nice weekend. You're making a mistake here, Director. You're placing all your bets on something that you don't understand. Like you said, these things are unpredictable. So what if the anomalies adapt and become stronger? What then? Do we sacrifice more lives and hope for the best? I'll find a way and make sure no more innocent lives will be lost.